No, I mean, uh, I only this one. This first, like, <laughs> I'm trying to get pens for our uh, asking. It is one thing to understand. Somebody, somebody to announce the ad also, if one could do a thanking for important experiences that have happened. Oh, that's a good idea. Karen is proposing also that we give thanks on the well, paper. So, sometimes uh, when, you, when people say, you can do, let's do an asking, and you yeah. don't really feel like asking for anything. Yeah, you know, you're once fine. you receive so, many th so much in life, well, you can thank. You know, yeah, there's not sure. much more to ask. Sure. You write it down and you fold it up and you stick it in the pot. Where is the pot? So, that's something we celebrate. We are also, ce also celebrating our first year in our park. We got this park a little bit more than a year ago, we have worked hard to put it together because it wasn't in very good condition. It still not is in very good condition. We hope to make it better. So that's why we are here today. Uh, in our program, we have a few things. We'll, first, Jeremiah will will uh, read some words of our master Silo. <laughs> 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 Jeremiah and, and uh, they they recorded the several pieces that that Silo wrote, or I don't know if they were speeches or, or something that he wrote, and they they are online now, so maybe you will be able to go and listen to it if you want again. Then we'll have a movie that is called The Sage of the Andes that our friend Daniel Zucker brought. The guy with the white hat made and produced in, in Canada, and you will learn a lot about Silo in the movie. You can ask him questions. <laughs> yeah, we can ask him. Le later on, we'll have a ceremony of well-being. We have a few ceremonies that we always uh, practice. It has to do a lot with experience. We, we don't just say things, but we try to experience and these ceremonies help a lot with that. So we'll do a little ceremony together. Later on we'll we'll burn these pieces of paper with our aspects. So that's that is the program for today. Now that we made the important part of eating and we are okay with that, we'll continue with the rest. Okay, so Jeremiah there you go. Thank you. So you want to give a little context? Yeah. Uh, Jer Jeremiah and I met about 12, was it 12 or 13 years ago um, at, Hunter, geez, at Hunter College. And um, the first couple of things we talked about were music and philosophy and spirituality. We were sort of filling each other out a little yes. bit, you know. I would throw out a name, he'd throw out a name. And I think you threw out Krishnamurti, and then you threw out Gurji. I was like, wow, he's upping the stakes. <laughs> I said, have you heard of Silo? So I just happen to have that, what he's going to read uh, on me, the um, talk he gave called On Being Human. And I gave it to him. He goes, read this. Report to me. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty loud. Some no. more history about how these, these new Silos words things come up? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I'm really excited about the the release of this new material because, um, I mean, aside from the fact that I enjoy listening to it and we've gotten some great feedback and, I, and I'm very fond of the ideas, um, a few months ago, uh, Mark and David Anderson and I met, three of us sat down. Actually. It's very sad because um, you know we do this non-violence work, and uh, you know we've done several events together uh, over the past I don't know how many years now. But um, it was very sad for me personally, and sort of ironic because uh, as I was going to meet these fellows to talk about our continued non-violence work, um, I got word that a friend of mine was murdered 
This was just a few months ago. Was murdered by two 16-year-old kids in a uh, in a parking lot in Queens. So this is very real to me. It's not at all abstract. Uh, the need for peace and nonviolence. And um, as Mark mentioned, uh, we had actually I think several philosophical discussions discussions before we ever made music together. So I think that's made a good basis now for what's you know. Like a twelve-year relationship of producing, collaborating, um, and now our sort of mothership-style band, which is called Earth Driver, has turned into EarthDriver.org, which I really want all you guys to check out when you get a chance if you haven't already. Um, and I'm a big fan of CeeLo myself. Uh, I, I find that in uh, political circles. I'm too spiritual for the political people and too political for the spiritual people. So, so here you're perfect. <laughs> I, I like I like this bringing together of those two worlds because I don't think you can negate one or the other. I think it's uh, it just doesn't work to try to negate one or the other. It's sort of irresponsible or sort of selfish when people fixate on, on the, the self without recognizing there is a society, there are policies that affect the way people live and so on. And likewise, I think just to analyze things just in terms of economics and not realize that there is emotion and feeling in this whole human struggle is also, both, both points of view seem to be missing something. So I really like this sort of marriage of, of spiritual ideas, of philosophical ideas, along with the political. So. This is regarding what is human. In Tortuguitas, Buenos Aires, Argentina, May 1st, 1983. To have an understanding of the human phenomenon in general is one thing, while one's own register of the humanity of the other is something quite different. Let's consider the first question, that is, an understanding of the human phenomenon in general. If one says that what is most characteristic of the human being is sociability or language or the transmission of experience, one still has not fully defined the human being, because we find all of these expressed in the animal world as well, if only in some elementary state of development. We can observe chemical recognition and consequent attractions or rejections in organisms of the hive, the school, or the pack. There are hosts parasitic and symbiotic forms of organization in which we can recognize elementary patterns of what we later see in more elaborate form in human groups. We also find a kind of animal morality with social punishment for transgressors, even when those behaviors viewed from the outside might be interpreted on the basis of the instinct of preservation of the species or as a complex of conditioned and unconditioned reflexes. Rudimentary technology is also not unknown in the animal world, nor are the emotions of affection, hostility, grief, and solidarity, whether among members of a group, or between groups, or between species. Well then, what is it that defines what is human as such, if not the reflection of the socio-historical as personal memory? Every animal is always the first animal, while every human being is his or her historical and social environment, along with a reflection of and a contribution to the transformation or inertia of that environment. For an animal, the environment is the natural environment. For the human being, the environment is the historical and social environment. The transformation of that environment, and certainly the adaptation of nature to both immediate and longer term needs, when compared to the systems of ideation, behavior, and life of the animal world, the human being's deferred response to immediate stimuli, the meaning and direction of human labor with respect to a future that is planned or imagined, presents us with a new characteristic. The broadening of the temporal horizon of human consciousness allows it to delay response to stimuli locating such phenomena in a complex mental space configured for the placement of deliberations, comparisons, and conclusions that lie outside the field of immediate perception. In other words, 
In the human being, there is no human nature unless this nature is considered a capacity distinct from that of other animals to move through various times that are outside the horizon of perception. Putting this in yet another way, if there is something natural in the human being, it is not in the mineral, vegetable, or animal sense, but rather in the sense that what is natural in the human being is change, history, transformation. It is difficult to adequately reconcile the idea of change with the idea of nature, and therefore we prefer not to use the word nature as it has been used in the past. This term that has been so often used to justify all sorts of treachery toward the human being. For example, simply because the original inhabitants of a particular place appear different from their foreign conquerors, these inhabitants were called aboriginals or natives because other races presented different morphologies or coloration. They were ascribed different natures within the human species. And so on. Thus, there was a natural order, and changing that order was a sin against all that was eternally established. Different races, different sexes, different social positions, all were fixed within a supposedly natural order that was to be conserved for all time. The idea of human nature, that it served an order of natural production, broke down in the period of industrial transformation. Yet even today, we still see vestiges of the zoological ideology of human nature. In the field of psychology, for example, in which people still talk about certain natural faculties such as the will and similar things, natural law, the state as part of a projected human nature, and other such notions have not contributed to progress, but only to historical inertia and the neg negation of transformation. If co-presence in human consciousness functions because of its enormous temporal broadening, and if the intentionality of human consciousness allows it to project a meaning, then what is most characteristic of the human being is being and making the meaning of the world. As this is said in Humanize the Earth, namer of a thousand names, maker of meanings, transformer of the world, your parents and the parents of your parents continue in you. You are not a fallen star, but a brilliant arrow flying toward the heavens. You are the meaning of the world, and when you clarify your meaning, you illuminate the earth. When you lose your meaning, the earth becomes darkened, and the abyss opens. I will tell you the meaning of your life here. It is to humanize the earth. And what does it mean to humanize the earth? It is to surpass pain and suffering. It is to learn without limits. It is to love the reality you build. We stand then at a great distance from the idea of human nature. In fact, at its polar opposite. What I mean is that if an imposed, supposedly permanent order, a nature, has ended up suffocating that which is human, now we are saying the contrary. What is natural must be humanized, and this humanization of the world makes humankind a creator of meaning, direction, and transformation. And if that meaning liberates us from the supposedly natural conditions of pain and suffering, then what is truly human is what goes beyond the natural. It is your project, your future, it is your child, it is your dawn, it is your breeze and your storm, it is your anger and your caress, it is your fear and trembling for a future, for a new human being free from pain and suffering. Let's now consider the second question, one's regard, or sorry, one's register of the humanity of others. Insofar as one registers the presence of the other as natural, then the other will be no more like an, no more than an object-like or perhaps animal presence. Insofar as one is anesthetized against perceiving the temporal horizon of the other, the other will have no meaning beyond a for me. The nature of the other person will be a for me. But when I constitute the other person as a for me, I constitute and alienate myself in my own for myself. I say 
I am for me, and in saying that, I close my horizon of transformation. People who make others into things make themselves into things too, thereby closing off their own horizons. Insofar as I do not experience the other except as a for me, my vital activity will not humanize the world. The other must be an inner register for me, a warm sensation of an open future that does not end in the objectifying non-meaning of death. To feel that which is human in the other is to feel the life of the other in a beautiful, multicolored rainbow that moves farther and farther away the more I try to stop, to seize, to capture its expression. You grow farther away and I take comfort if I have helped you to break your chains, to overcome your pain and suffering. And if you accompany me, it is because in a free act, you constitute yourself as a human being and not simply because you were born human. I sense in you the liberty and the possibility of your constituting yourself as a human being. And in you, my acts find liberty at which they aim. And so, not even your death can halt the actions you set in motion, because you are, in essence, time and liberty. What I love in the human being, then, is its growing humanization. And in these times of crisis, reification and dehumanization, I love the possibility of the human being's future vindication. How are we going to continue with our non-violence efforts, our, our, our activities? And, um, you know, one of the goals was we wanted to make CeeLo's work available on our record label. And I asked if we had permission or, or how we could go about doing that. And David Anderson came up with the idea of me narrating it. And then Mark came up with the, the great ambient background and the whole project came together. So that was our, our first goal. And the second goal is, I said to David Anderson, you know, let's put a real show together, you know, because our group, Earth Driver, if you haven't seen it, it's like a big, it's sort of like a, a, it's a circus kind of, kind of, uh, kind of event. It's like, you can wear two shoes, no shoes, or one shoe on the bandstand, you know, it's like, you come dressed up however you want, and it's a whole kind of, you know, coming together of different people and, and people from different backgrounds and a sort of blend of musical styles and everything as well. So the point is, the second goal of this meeting that we had a few months ago is I said, you know, let's let's do an event, but let's, you know, put a big concert together. Let's make a spectacle. Let's let's get people's attention, you know, like we've already come out and done the kind of like acoustic guitar and sing kind of thing. But let's not hold back. Let's bring the whole mothership horns, percussion, multiple singers, poets, and everything. So that's what we're trying to do August 20th in Jackson Heights. Unfortunately, we don't have physical flyers here, but everybody stay in touch. And if you know David Anderson, he's sort of a point person for this. But um, August 20th in Jackson Heights, I'm not sure the exact start time, but we're trying to make a big sort of outdoor coming together of people to express these sort of ideas out in the open. And for the first time, like I said, it's going to be a pretty big production. It's not going to be just like okay. an acoustic guitar there.